we also teach officers um, handcuff application, uh, the use of the baton as an intermediate weapon, pressure points, escorts, strikes, so on and so forth. Welcome to A Father's Role. I'm Danny. And I'm Jason. And uh, I'm super excited tonight because uh, we have a special guest joining us, uh, Mr. Johnny Lee Smith. Uh, Johnny is uh, responsible for getting me into jiu-jitsu uh, through a choke, so I'm very thankful that he's here. Um, one reason Johnny is here is, one, he's a, a fifth-degree black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, he's the founder of Triad Martial Arts in Coleman, Alabama. He's also the founder of uh, SSGT, and that's what I'm training with Johnny in uh, this week. It's a defensive tactic programs for law enforcement, and that's what our, we're going to be talking about this evening is really law enforcement, defensive tactics, their need for training. And um, so SSGT stands for uh, Strategic Self-Defense uh, and Gunfighting Tactics, and uh, we are super excited to have you on, Johnny. So thank you for coming on the show this evening. Thank you. Appreciate right. it, guys. SSGT Vanguard is a complete defensive tactics program. In the state of Alabama, when an officer goes through the police academy, they get 24 hours of level one Vanguard and 24 hours of level two Vanguard. And um, this the program has saved lives. It's uh, reduced the incidence of officers using excessive force. And we just had tremendous success with it. Um, and, and, you know, I guess... If you, uh, if you look at what they used to do, the program that existed before we came along, that, that program, it really isn't hardly even around anymore. Yeah. And uh, we've, we've pretty much just replaced them. And that's, uh, you know, I, I feel like it was a, a huge step forward for, for not just for us, but for law enforcement in the Southeast, because what they were getting was just not sufficient. And so I, I just got on a mission to make things better for cops. Yeah. And, um, and I think we've done that. There was something interesting that you've brought up, and it's it's funny because the first episode I was like, I think all the law enforcement officers need to be in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Like, oh, of course, one, that's one thing that we're passionate about. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, thank you for bringing me into that. You know, right. that's been a, a huge love and obviously a passion and why we started, in part, the podcast to talk right. about jiu-jitsu um, from really an old guy's perspective. You know, I feel yeah. bad because Johnny's, we were stretching today and he's, He's still in physical top, you know, top physical condition, and I still get ragged a lot about my flexibility, John. Yeah. So um, we've let ourselves go. But we're talking about, you know, that's something that we're passionate about. But it's interesting because you have a little bit different take about jujitsu and law enforcement, and uh, man, I think it's very valuable. Do you mind sharing just a little bit, like where you would say, well, that can be a good thing, and it can be a bad thing. Right. Well, um, I'm a believer that you're going to default to your conditioning. So under stress, your default position is going to be whatever you've been conditioned to do. Now, that conditioning may go back to your training because I've heard trainers say you're going to default to your training. Mm. Well, that's not always true. For instance, if your training was really bad and you didn't like it, that won't be your default position. Right. Right. If the training was good, but you left it going, well, I thought it was good training. I liked the material, but I don't remember how to do it. It didn't stick. You didn't do enough repetitions to make it a conditioned response. Right? Right. right. So in both cases, you're not going to default to your training. One, it was bad. The other, it was, it was not done enough to be ingrained in your psyche. So you're probably going to uh, default to something you did in grammar school, middle school, high school, backyard scrapping, whatever you want to call it. Right. We don't know what you're going to default to, right? So the fact is you are going to default to something, and it will be whatever your brain is most deeply conditioned to do. That is a fact. And so um, – I would say that if you're considering going to a martial arts class, a kickboxing class, um, some sort of martial arts class, I think first you need to ask yourself, when it comes to defensive tactics, when it comes to self-defense, 
in a given situation, what do I want to see myself do? Mm -hmm. You envision that, and then you say, okay, I'm going to condition myself to do that. And realize that if you then train in sport aspect of martial arts, the sport aspect of martial arts may condition you to do something very different. Mm -hmm. Right. And, And I'll give you an example. I think it's a very bad idea to punch the human head in Mm self-defense for a cop. I think it's really, it's not a great idea for anybody, but in particular, it's a bad idea for a cop because if you, and I'm not talking about justification or not, let's assume you're justified in punching someone in the head as a law enforcement officer. That's not an issue. The issue is you punch the human head, you break your knuckles, you break your hand, And a moment later, you need to use that same hand that's now broken to draw your gun, draw your taser, get your baton out. And now you can't do that effectively because you've broken your hand. Now, I think most people that are practitioners of defensive tactics would agree that it's a bad idea for a cop to punch the human head. But those same people may say, well, yeah, I think it's a great idea for you to go take MMA or boxing. Really? Do mm-hmm. you? You think that for everybody? Right. I don't think that for everybody because when you go to boxing class and MMA class, you're going to put on gloves and you're going to punch the human head. Now, some people can do that, come out of that environment, put them into a self defense environment. They won't punch the head, they'll throw elbows, palm heels, hammer fists. But those people are the exception, not the rule. For most people, whatever they do the most, that's going to be their default position. Right, yeah. And and you have to decide on a personal level, can I dual condition? Can I condition myself for self-defense scenarios and then also condition myself for sport fighting? And if I feel that on a personal level that sport fighting is going to condition me to do the wrong thing i'm going to stop training the sport aspect and i'm going to totally focus on the real self-defense aspect so when someone says do you think every cop in america should do brazilian jiu-jitsu my answer to that is no Mm -hmm. just like i don't think every cop in america should go to boxing class or mma class or kickboxing class or muay thai class Do I think every cop in America should do relevant defensive tactics training? Yes. Every single cop in America. Mm -hmm. Is is the defensive tactics training, if it's it's sufficient and and solid, is it going to involve elements from jiu-jitsu? Yes. But that's very different than saying, I think every cop in America should be on the mats, rolling around, uh, trying to get submissions, trying to get arm bars, trying to get chokes. Because the reality is, if they do that night after night in the gym, you can be guaranteed that there's going to be a hefty percentage of cops that's going to go right out on the street, and that's going to be their default position. And 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 so, no, it's not for everybody. Right. There, but there are people that can dual condition, and for them, I don't I don't think they're going to have a problem. I'm one of those people that can dual condition, but I can't speak for you or you or anybody else. It's Mm -hmm. a personal decision that you have to make. Right. But it doesn't fit everyone. Well, it it actually, you were talking about that this morning in class, and it was not the dual conditioning aspect is not anything that's really hit me before um, because I I would be one that uh, with various different experiences, I can, I feel like I can dual condition. So it's not ever been really a thought on my mind, you know, Mm -hmm. until I was sitting there this morning, I was like, hmm. I've not really thought about that, you know, uh, lapel guard or anything else that works great for the gym uh, and in a gi, but that's not necessarily something that you want to throw, you know, even on the street. And that was the other thing, too, that you said this morning that um, one thing I like about SSGT and as far as it's it's a very simple system for uh, for that purpose, you know, so that's not overly complex that somebody's having to re- remember A, B, C, D, E, F, G yeah. all the way down the line to get to the to, to the end 
uh, end goal or de, you know desired outcome as far as compliance goes. Um, so that was something that hit me this morning when you said that. I said, well, man, I haven't considered that because I was the guy who was like, I think everybody should do this. But mm-hmm. you're absolutely right. And it's something that I had not considered till I heard you say that to say, hmm, I have not considered that. You know, as far as somebody defaulting to that like or even slapping and dapping and going so that was a so so let's uh, let's let's flesh that out just a touch more let me say this because uh, i use this as an example this morning in your class and i think for your listeners this would make perfect sense let's say that the mixed martial arts community made the decision that they were going to allow fighters to get into the ring into the cage if you will uh, with firearms on their hips. So both fighters, as they step into the cage, will have loaded firearms in holsters on their hips, and they can use them if they need them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now, do you believe that the fighters who are preparing for an event such as that would prepare very differently than they do right now? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. preparation would be quite different. I don't think... I don't think it would look anything like what we see right now when when fighters are going to get in there and they know there's no chance of of somebody pulling the gun. There's no chance of anybody having a pocket knife on their person. Mm -hmm. You know, that that changes things. And so you can't come to law enforcement defensive tactics training with this sport fighting mindset because it's a very different world. Another example that I give. What if the mixed martial arts community uh, you know those in charge came out with the rule and said look new rule if your fighter is losing you can climb over the side of the cage and jump in there and help them right Mm -hmm. you can jump in there anytime you want if you feel like your guy's losing just jump in there and start beating up on the other guy would the fighters prepare for an event like that very differently than the events they prepare for now. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it would not be the same. All right. And and I think the mistake that the that the martial arts community makes so often uh, in in LE training is they just don't they don't they don't get that. Right. They they're trying to make cops into jujitsu players. Jujitsu has much to offer. I love it. It's changed my life. Right. But you have to be able to make jujitsu work for law enforcement, not make law enforcement into jujitsu practitioners. Yeah, that's, that's it, man. Yeah, that's great. That's a good, very, very solid point. Um, and and again, that's that's great. I can't even add to that. Um, as far as because the system that you created is simple. Um, we also know, and maybe you can speak to this as far as. So even with the SIP system that we have, our training time is super limited. So I go and train in the gym as far as jujitsu three times a week, hopefully, you know. Mm-hmm. So how how do we how do you change how do you change that? You know, like for to add more emphasis on defensive tactics where. Uh, because you you know this you've you've been around law enforcement long enough to know the challenges like well we got we got patrol to do we've got these admin duties we got to do we got to do this and this and this and this at the at the same time you know baseline is like well safety should be number one but we don't get enough time to train that how do you flip that paradigm at all or add to or emphasize that in a way that it becomes more more of an importance if the, if I'm asking that question correctly so there's 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 two different angles here one is the administration angle and the other is the personal angle administratively i think this whole situation with uh, minneapolis has um, made and i know this firsthand because i've i've gotten calls from chiefs and from sheriffs the situation in minneapolis has made those in leadership positions in departments reevaluate the training that they're giving. Right. They're asking questions that they weren't asking before. Um, and training programs are being revamped and revised. Um, you know, we've never taught a net restraint 
in SSGT, never. And I can't tell you how many uh, officers have called me and said, now, when, you, SSGT doesn't teach neck restraints, no. Well, I know we didn't do any when we went through, when I went through the program, but I was just gonna make sure, now, you, you, you don't teach any neck restraints in any, no, no, we never have. Right, yeah. Well, um, that is because we could see the writing on the wall that a neck restraint many years ago, the use of a neck restraint became a political issue in some areas. And I said, well, once you attach, once you attach politics to an issue, uh, you just need to get away from it. Right. Yeah. You know? right. And, and, and as a trainer, I said, you know, right. I don't want to deal with that. I mean, I, I think it's look, if you can pull a gun and shoot someone to argue that you can't choke that person, you, you're not going to sell me on that argument. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not whether or not there's times that a neck restraint can be useful or whether or not a neck restraint could even save somebody's life. And, and if you think about it, I'm certain historically that there are individuals, subjects, who have had a neck restraint applied to them. They went to sleep, they woke up in handcuffs, and it had not been, and had it not been for the neck restraint, that individual would have been shot. Yeah. The neck restraint probably saved people's lives. Right, right. But the reality is the neck restraint cost some people their lives, and then it became this cudgel to beat up uh, defensive tactics training with and say, well, you know, it's just, it's horrible, it's awful, and you can't do that. And I said, well, okay, you know, we're not going to do it. We're, and so we just, we never went there. Uh, it's not part of our program, but uh, administrators were calling me wanting to know, you don't teach that. No, I don't. The point I'm making is this. Administrators are now interested in defensive tactics. They weren't six months ago. Yeah. They weren't. Now they realize what you teach your people actually matters. Yeah, you may have some really jacked up stuff being taught to your officers and if and if you do i'm sorry chief but it's your fault because you're the chief right and it's your job to have your eyes and ears on what's being taught how it's being taught and so i think and the chiefs and sheriffs realize that and so now what they're doing is they're really looking at dt and they're going we got to get more serious with our dt so i think on that level we're sitting in a pretty good spot as far as agencies being willing to take training more seriously because they're listening now yeah right and yeah. it's unfortunate that it took someone's death to to make someone listen because you know uh the knee on the neck what what uh, what officer chauvin was doing i mean i i never have taught anything like right. that i wouldn't teach anything like that and um and i'm not glad that that event happened i think it i think the whole event was just horrible but you have to look at events like that and try yeah. to bring some, there has to be some silver lining around that, that cloud, right? Right. And the silver lining is, well, agencies are paying attention to what's being taught now, where maybe before they weren't paying as close of attention, right? Right. And, and I think defensive tactics has moved up in priority level, which is better for the officer it's better for the citizens it's better for everybody and so and, and i'm happy about that so the second angle um is emphasizing to the officers the importance of training um you know getting officers to watch um videos of actual events in in the line of duty uh, all the things that that trainers typically do but here's the reality i can't make you care about yourself yeah <laughs> that's right yeah yeah I, I can't make you care about going home to your family right i can't make you want to live yeah i can't i can't i also can't make you actually feel what I'm trying to explain to you could be a reality to you. In other words, I explained to you that, you know, it could be you tonight on your shift that goes out here and gets in a shootout for your life. It could be you. And I can't make you not put that in the back of your mind and go, yeah, that's not going to be me. Yeah. So 
there are people that you just can't reach. Yeah. Because for me to reach them, they have to come halfway to me. You know, my arm only extends so far. And for me to reach you, it requires you reaching your arm halfway this way. That's right. And if you're not reaching back, we're not going to connect. And you're just going to continue on doing what you're doing, throwing caution to the wind, not prioritizing training, not prioritizing fitness, not prioritizing your own personal health. I can't make you care about yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. All I can do is extend my arm out. And if you don't reach back, what can I do? Right. And, and so, uh, I, and I don't know how big of a problem that is in the law enforcement community. I, I, I tend to believe that a bigger problem is the fact that so many cops work their job, they get off, and they go to another job, or they get off their regular job, and they're going to work overtime mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they don't get paid enough. Right, right. Yep. And and I've got I, you know by the time I work the, my regular shift, and then I work overtime to actually make some money. By the time I get through doing that and maybe a third job, I don't have any energy. I yep. don't have any time. And if I'm going to make time for my spouse or my kids, I'm you know, I, I mean I just can't do but so much. I think right. that's what a lot of cops face. Is you know there's so little pay. In the in the in this you know profession, that they're having to work themselves to death to make ends meet, mm -hmm. and um, you know and 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 I know cops who their cops and their spouse doesn't work, and they're they're a one income family. Well, that's that is dang tough to be a one income family with just you know, and and you're a cop. Yeah. So then that requires that. The, whoever the cop is, the the husband or the wife or whatever, that requires that they put in some very long hours. Right. Well, then who's got the energy and time to train? That's right. You know, I I don't fault those guys for that. They're trying to survive. Yeah. They need better pay. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. That's yeah. a novel idea. No, you're you're right on you're right on point with that. And and of course that's been our family for uh, up until you know recently we've made the decision for my wife to start looking for a job this year but up until that point we've kind of made in meet it made ends meet you know wherever we could now that was a decision we made uh mm -hmm. just so that she could be there for um for our kids at home uh, but that was that was our decision you know right. um but still that's a you know being a single income uh a family on a on a law enforcement salary is is challenging and, and you're absolutely right because after you go and do that and i was painting on the side some and stuff like that i mean it's exhausting because mm -hmm. then you're you're just giving whatever little bit of energy you got um and that's i mean that's reality you know yeah. as opposed to it's not that for the majority part that people don't care it's just they're exhausted um and i, I hope that's something that comes out uh, of this you know obviously uh our society is somewhat in turmoil with you know police officers and and the other mess that's going on but you know and they're talking about revamping uh you know i just hear what's on the news but revamping you know the police uh, police officers and how they do things but hopefully through all that if that does occur hopefully what comes out of that is better training and hopefully higher pay because people are, are not wanting to do that job with what right. they're getting paid and what they have to face yeah you know going out there especially nowadays going out there not knowing if they're going to come home or not mm -hmm. because of the craziness that's out there so it, uh, yeah and even just the hate hate towards law enforcement right. right now not across the board i mean we still i still run into folks daily they're like hey i just want to thank you for what you do mm -hmm. and i should say as far as a training perspective um our department's been shifting that perspective uh, as as in the few, last few years well several years actually um so I, i'll say i'm thankful to be a part of a department that's putting more focus on training which is the reason i'm even here with you this uh, week is we're right. incorporating back uh, some some defense and we actually had that discussion last year right. so the decision was made for us to begin to build on that defensive tactic program more than we did even before all this started so that with everything that's happened since then uh absolutely that's been pushed you know to the forefront uh you've also said something that um kind of resonated because it's something that that i tend to to see with a lot of um different scenarios the last thing i want to do and, and we're not and, and not even going into specific scenarios that happen because um, 
there's a totality of circumstances that goes in every use of force scenario, and it, you know the the courts and us should look at it uh, in regards to you know uh, not hindsight being 2020, but what's, right. what's occurring right at that time. Uh, what would an objectively reasonable officer do? So I don't, I don't want to beat up on anybody in that regard. So I'm trying to phrase that question properly. But one thing I do see. Um, you know, in the Marine Corps, we had a saying, you know, we want to teach you guys to shoot, move and communicate. Like if you can just shoot and move and communicate, we've got, you know, we're a lot further down the road. Um, with that, a lot of our training and we've started with our department, we bought some SIM guns and adding some more scenario based training, um, and and changing scenarios to get guys thinking. Um, I think that's a big, uh, a big problem sometimes is we don't train, when it comes to training, sometimes we're not training thinkers, right? You were right. in the military and you yeah. saw that too, where you're training someone to think on their feet as opposed to A and B equals C all the time because it never does. <laughs> I've never been on one real world mission where everything just happens like it's supposed to. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but you you play, you brought this up today, and I think it's a I think it's a big element because uh, it, it was the the element of fear. Uh, and I, th- I personally feel like that plays a part in a lot of our either poor decisions or uh, overly, uh, overly excessive use of force in, cer- in scenarios because it comes back to sometimes a training issue. Can you speak about that just briefly uh, as, as well as far as really being afraid because you haven't trained yourself in a scenario to deal with that situation? Well... I think I think we can all relate to this idea um, of the fear of the unknown. Mm-hmm. Um, children and some adults are afraid of the dark. Mm-hmm. Right? Why? It's not because it's dark. It's because I can't see. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's there. Don't know what's not there. It's the fear of the unknown. And so. When people get on the mat, when they get in the ring and they spar and they grapple and they fight, they deal with the fear of someone squishing and crushing them. They deal with the fear of getting punched in the face. And they realize that it's not all that bad. I can deal with this. It's it's when people don't know that that it's a problem. Right, right. It's the unknown. Yeah. You know, this guy gets, he's on top of me. Oh, oh I got to get him off. I got to get him off. You know, and they freak out and they, and they panic. Right. And so, you know, then fear, it, it overcomes you. You know, fear is a great tool. Fear motivates us to put on a life jacket. Fear motivates us to drive safely so we don't have a wreck and and I'm I'm fearful of killing my family driving like a fool, right? Right, right, yeah. So, so a level of fear is a good thing. But when fear begins to control you and fear begins to cause you to freeze up and you can't act, well, then fear is – it's in control. It's in charge. You have fear, but you're in charge of that fear. You control that fear. The way you deal well, – the way you accomplish that is by facing the fear. If if you know when it comes to defensive tactics, if you know that your ability to escape from the bottom is is bad, and you also know that you're claustrophobic and you just hate the idea of someone being on top of you, crushing you, then you need to be there in that exact position as often as you can be and learn to mitigate that fear. Learn Learn to face it and just do that head on. Right. But the thing you also need to learn to do is to think under under stress. That's one of the great things about uh, jiu-jitsu and, and even, even stand-up fighting, but it, I think it's probably more apparent in, in jiu-jitsu, is you're being crushed and you're just being mashed and twisted and turned, but yet you still have to think. Yeah. You still right. have to plot. You yeah. still have to plan. And, and, you know, being able to think under pressure, being able to think uh, while things are, are flying at you, that is an invaluable skill. Mm-hmm. You need that. Right. All, all great fighters have that ability. They can think on their feet. 
under that pressure, boom, boom, they're getting hit, they're getting smashed, whatever. They can think. They keep that thought process going, and 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 that's you can't put a price on that. But you also can't achieve that except through being there. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and um, so you just have to embrace the misery of being in those situations. I've had conversations with people that similar to that, not exactly talking about what you're talking about, but they've asked me about things that I've been through or whatever, and I said, "Well, you just." You don't know what you don't know, right? And it's you know, in a generality, it, that's kind of you know a little bit of what you're talking about is that if you're uncomfortable with something, you're you don't know how you're going to react until you put yourself in that situation so that you can know how you're going to react, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a, which is where you learn, you right? Know, where you learn that you're going to be okay. And, and one thing we always do when we're doing those scenario based things is is try to leave leave that officer with a win too. You know, so it's just not like, man, that was terrible. You would have got your face shot off. You know, it's just trying to trying to to do that win and and I guess be positive and encouraging because that can be because it is the unknown. You know, because it is an unknown scenario and it may be the first time that they've had to to think in that scenario. It can be overwhelming, and so we always try to make sure that they leave thinking about you know the positive or hey, you know these are things we do need to work on. Right. Well, and and I think one of the things that I that I said today. It, it it plays a role in this. You know, if I don't have a good foundation, mm-hmm. if I don't have solid defense, you know, I said uh, in one of my early lessons with Hickson, he, he told me that defense was number one. That is my mantra. Defense is number one. Um, but along with that, one of the things I said today was, you know, you're going to find yourself, whether you are a baseball player, football player, basketball player, a jiu-jitsu player, an MMA fighter, boxer, kick, it doesn't matter. You at some point are going to face a situation that you didn't exactly prepare for. Mm -hmm. Something is going to be in front of you, and you're going to say, gee whiz, I never freaking thought about that. (laughs) Yeah. And 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 it may be uh, it may be one of these fast paced just it, it's just a brief moment or it may be you're stuck crap I didn't you know and and here's the thing you will at that moment when you face that situation that you didn't exactly prepare for you will then begin to adapt and improvise in order to overcome mm-hmm. now the adaptation. And the improvisation that you do to overcome that situation that you did not particularly prepare for, to make those improvisations and adaptations, you're going to draw from your foundation of fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Your fundamentals are what you're going to draw from to make lib, to add do. Okay? This is exactly why great coaches have always stressed the importance of fundamentals because everybody it doesn't matter if you have good fundamentals or if you don't if you're in the arena okay whether you have good or fundamental good fundamentals or not if you're in the arena you stay in that arena long enough you will face a situation that you didn't exactly it's just a little this is not exactly what i expected right and in both cases Good fundamentals, not good fundamentals. And for both of you, you're both going to have to improvise. You're both going to have to adapt. But who's going to who's going to do a better job at improvising and at and adapting to that to that situation? The person with good fundamentals, because they're going to draw from those fundamentals, if if you will, to make something up to pull something out of their ear Mm -hmm. they're 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 gonna draw from their fundamentals to to do that right Right. yeah right right if you don't have good fundamentals whatever you create on the fly is probably not going to be very good (laughs) that's right because your fundamentals are bad right and so i just i just think that uh that and, and and if you have that the the foundation of solid fundamentals your confidence level goes up, just like I talked about about defense. If your if your confidence level goes up, 
not because of arrogance, but because of the fact that you know you have the skill set, you have a good, solid foundation, your confidence level is going to go up, the fear level comes down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not cockiness or arrogance. It's just, it's just fact, mm -hmm. you know. And um, that would go a long way to helping a lot of officers who, you know, it, I mean, it has to be, it has to be that there are officers out there who've been involved in situations who have used excessive force and it was out of a res it was a result of they were fearful they didn't have the training to to deal with the situation and it scared them mm -hmm. and then when they got scared they ramped up and they used more force not necessarily excessive force on a legal standard but right. they used more force than maybe they otherwise would have if they had had more confidence that had a better skill set right you know it has to be. It has to be that way. Just the law of averages. So I'm a believer that cops need solid fundamental training and defensive tactics, That and that's their foundation that they're going to build everything else on. And, um, you know, I also want to say uh, that, you know, when I talked earlier about, you know, defensive tactics, uh, I don't want to fail to mention that we have a firearms division. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack Neville's, uh, Sergeant Major, uh, retired Sergeant Major Jack Neville's. Uh, he was a third group guy, seventh group guy. He is the SSGT firearms guru, if you will, mm -hmm. and um, great guy. If you ever need firearms training, make sure you look us up on the look it up on the website. So. Yeah, that awesome. that was good because we're you know we're kind of talking that one aspect of really training. You know, and that plays a part. Um, uh, as a, in a, in a one, I'm one of our firearms instructors as well. So both, you know, that was one thing we discussed today. Really, both your defensive tactics and your firearms program need to marry each other mm -hmm. and need to, need to supplement each other. You need to be thinking tactically um, hand to hand as, I, as well as I am in, in, on the range as well. So that's a, that's a good point. And uh, definitely, you know, thanks for plugging that for sure. Um, well, as far as the, the, the We've really covered a lot of the training right. um, and, and the need for defensive tactics. Uh, we discussed kind of the overcoming the fear element and the need for really scenario-based training and actually putting yourself in, in situations that are uncomfortable. You know, that's that's jujitsu, right? But right. that's also here, too, as far as training, you know, for the law enforcement officer that you, you need to be uncomfortable. Not so much that you've pushed somebody point past their breaking point, but as an instructor, you kind of need to know, Okay, this is all they can handle right now, and you kind of walk those baby steps. Um, so that's huge and important. Another thing that we had discussed uh, prior to filming and and recording today was just really the current culture. You know, as far as to, towards law enforcement, like I said, not everybody hates police right now. Right. Um, we still have those but, people that come up and say, "Hey, man, thanks, appreciate what you do." And I would almost kind of venture to say. Um, I would I would say there's really the majority that are not against law enforcement. That may be the narrative that we're being pushed right now. And I think it is. I, I think that's what they're trying to push. Like you said, they're trying to push a narrative. They're trying to get some things that they want, and um, they're trying to make everybody think that they that everybody's against cops. And that's just it's just not the case. I don't believe. But one thing we were talking about, uh, um, really kind of changing that culture. And, and Johnny, you've got something in the works that can kind of help. Um, show the human side of the badge. Would you mind sharing a little bit about uh, Battle of the Blue? Yes. Um, so back in, um, I think it was July of 18, I was uh, down for the count a little bit. I had some health issues going on. And I'm one of those people that just can't ever quit working. Mm -hmm. my, my wife will tell you that. <laughs> and um, so um, I, was, I was home taking some rest, uh, trying to heal up. And I had this idea for uh, a show, TV show called Battle of the Blue. Um, the idea is uh, cops face a lot of battles in the line of duty. Um, the battle to keep the streets safe, the battle to keep their home lives together, the battle of dealing with negative imagery in the media, the battle uh, of dealing mentally with the things uh, that they've seen other people do to other people and dealing with the things that they've been forced to do just to, you know, being a cop. And so 
I brought this idea to my uh, to my uh, my buddy Jack. Uh, he's our, our he's the firearms guru, and he and I started ba- you know uh, pitching it back and forth to each other, and, and we just kind of came up with this concept of Battle of the Blue, uh, where where we bring uh, law enforcement officers together at an exclusive location. We provide them training, and then that training is confirmed through competition. And at the end of training days, at the end of competition days, everybody sits around, we share a common meal together, and then we hear some you know, deep story from one of these officers about something that they've dealt with in the line of duty that just wrenches your heart. I mean, you just hear stories that if you don't get a tear in your eye, it's only because you have no eyes, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, right. It, it, it just, it, the, the, it's just things that get you and things that you won't hear. And it's things that these guys will tell me because the things I've noticed about cops is if they don't trust you, they won't talk to you. That's right. right. And they open up to me because they know I'm on their side mm-hmm. and they know that I'm going to do respect and justice to their story uh, as well as Jack. And they trust us. And, and so um, the idea of the show is to, one, to highlight the importance of training because we believe if you want a better officer, provide the officers with better training. Right. If you don't like what you see your officers doing in the field, train them to do differently. And we believe that better training will result in you know, less occurrences of excessive use of force, less occurrences hopefully of officers using deadly force when it's when it's not needed right um if it's needed it's needed right um and we so we want to highlight the importance of training and the value that it has for the officers the value it has for the community and but also we want to highlight the battles and the struggles that cops face just being who they are it's it's tough it is a it is a real daily battle. I mean, we alluded earlier to the low pay and the long hours and the extra jobs. I mean, that's just part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at the divorce rate in the law enforcement community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think the divorce rate is so high in the law enforcement community because you know, all these cops are just, you know, unfaithful people. I think it's I think it's largely because the family suffers because the the cop, the husband, the wife, the cop, is just gone all the time. Yeah, I mean, right. you know, if you can't spend time with your family, distance starts to, you know, you start to get distance between you. I don't know you. You don't know me. We're just, we pass each other in the hallway. And that is a huge burden on a family. It's hard to keep a family together when you spend a lot of time together. Yeah. But then you take that time and it's like, we have no time, and when we do have time, I'm exhausted. Yeah, and I'm stressed out. Completely. Yeah, that's what I was you saying. Know? Yeah. So I don't think the divorce rate is high because cops are any different morally or however you want to look at it from any other group of people. It's the stress of the job. Right. And and and, and it's hard. So, you know, I think America doesn't really understand the battles that cops face just being cops. And so what we want to do with the show is we want to highlight the importance of training and highlight the battles that these officers face just being who they are and bring the, bring America into touch with that yeah and um, humanize police officers yeah. because they they are doing a thankless job you know right. when the cops show up in all likelihood it's that's not your best day right <laughs> that's right you know and you're probably not happy to see them yeah you know when the fireman shows up Oh, the fireman's here. Mm-hmm. But when the cop shows up, oh my gosh, the cops are here. Right. Or oh, get out of here, the cops are here. Yeah. 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 It's it's Run. it's rarely <laughs> ever good. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and they deal with this this negative, negative, negative shift after shift, call after call. Someone's dead. Someone's hurt. Someone's done wrong. Someone's done this. Someone's done. And you just shift after shift after shift. It's tough. Yeah. It's hard. And um, it takes special people to do that. And, and, you know, you were saying earlier that there's the people in the country that are anti-police, and and they are there. But I firmly believe the majority recognize that we all live in a civil society 
because a we're a nation of law right mm-hmm. and then b if we're a, if we're going to be a nation of laws those laws have to be enforced that's right and we have to have people to enforce them mm-hmm. i don't think people all of a sudden want to live in anarchy right i just don't believe that <laughs> no neither I, I think people they think they do until they have to call the police <laughs> yeah <laughs> like we've yeah. seen some of that yeah. absolutely you've seen it on tv people yeah. that they're wanting all this anarchy and then something starts to happen people start getting shot and they're like call the police right yeah like, i'm fine with anarchy as long as it's your house <laughs> right That's exactly right. yeah yeah but i'm so all of a sudden i'm not happy with it when it's my house yeah right um, so tell us uh, where there's sizzle reel for the Battle of the Blue, where people can go and see that. So you can go to battleoftheblue.com, okay. and you can watch the two-and-a-half-minute sizzle reel. Down below that, um, there's an excerpt from an interview with uh, Officer Leslie Hines, okay. and it's a riveting interview. It's called She's Not Alone. It's about two minutes, and both are well worth watching. It gives you an idea of the type of interviews that we're going to do on Battle of the Blue. As far as the show taking off, is there anything that you guys uh, are needing right now to to make sure that that show happens? We have a channel that wants our show. um, And this channel is is on, you know, DirecTV. It's on Dish, Hulu. I mean, it's it's got, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty good size. The, where we are right now is, is finding some, uh, sponsorship partners okay. which we don't think is going to be that difficult since we already have a channel that said we want your show right, right. Yeah. you yeah. know we we have that mm-hmm. um, it, so we're just in this phase two of uh, trying to find the right sponsorship partners got gotcha. you gotcha. and we're going to link that information in the description below so you guys if you want to go see that you can uh, check it out it's going to be battle of the blue.com and we'll we'll link that in the description below yeah, as well, um, we're going to kind of wrap up. But, Johnny, thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, it's just a fount of, of knowledge and information. Absolutely. Love to pick your brain some more, but I know we're on a time schedule. So thank you for being here. Oh, man, Appreciate my it. pleasure. I, I enjoyed talking with you guys. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I thank you all for, for doing this. Appreciate you having me on, having me on here. Well, thank thank you. you. And for those of uh, for those are, that are still with us and watching, um, I know we, we have some other law enforcement officers that do subscribe, and they're outside of uh, the seven states that are currently covered by SSGT. So if that is something that you're you're watching, and you go, man, I'd like for my department to kind of check that out. If you'll go to gossgt.com, um, that's going to be uh, the website, and there'll be plenty, plenty of information there that you can run through your department. So if you're looking at an offensive tactics program, I hope that you'll consider SSGT and that you'll uh, go to the website, check it out for your department, kind of in- integrate that into your training uh, as well. If you find yourself in Coleman, Alabama, uh, we haven't got into uh, Johnny's protege with Daniel O'Brien, another uh, great, uh, talented black belt there um, who's kind of running running triad for... Yes, he... he, uh, he- he runs the school that I founded, so that's right. He's he's the man now. I'm the old man. He's the man. He's the man. <laughs> well, and and you guys have been extremely um, gracious. Uh, there's been a few times I've been traveling through that area that you guys have let me train there, and thank you for that. So if you're going through that area and you want a place to to get some good training as far as uh, jujitsu or karate, um, drop in at, tri- at Triad Martial Arts in Coleman, Alabama. They'll be happy to see you there. So. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, once again, thanks for joining us. Um, all this information will be linked in the description below. Um, if you like what you're seeing, uh, please subscribe to our channel, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Catch you next time.